This is during the Last Supper in the upper room, the night before Jesus was crucified, when he instituted communion. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, once a year we have this special day in the life of our church when we have uh, our young people coming to take communion at the table for the very first time. And so yesterday, our second grade Sunday school class, who consisted only of little Leah Murphy, I think she was very courageous to to be all by herself, but I, I hear from Pam she had a great time and it was a wonderful class. But the class is to teach the children about the importance of the Lord's Supper so that they're going to be prepared to receive it the first time. At least they're going to have some understanding of why we do this. It's not just a little piece of bread and a little tiny cup of grape juice. There's a lot more to to it than that. And firsts are always memorable in our lives, but from time to time, I think we all need a refresher course. And so this morning I'd like to take just a few minutes to refresh us as to the significance of the Lord's Supper for congregational Christians. Well, communion, as we call it, was known to our ancestors as the Lord's Supper. And it's one of only two sacraments that are practiced in in the congregational way. Uh, These because they were the only two that we see Jesus instituting in the Bible. According to John von Rohr, who wrote a great book called The Shaping of American Congregationalism, our pilgrim forebears view the sacraments as seals of the covenant of grace. In other words, they're visible signs that God has given to us to confirm to us believers individually that God makes covenant promises through his word to us and to our church. And they cannot be separated from the word. The promise cannot be taken away from the word. And so the promises have no independent significance apart from the word, the word of God. So what did the pilgrims mean by the word? Well, the word was both the person of Jesus Christ, the living word, if you will, and God's word in the Bible. That's the word of God. And so they believed that Jesus was present in a very unique way in the Lord's Supper, And the sacrament should never be celebrated without first preaching the word. They saw that the elements of the bread and wine were preachers of the word. I love that. That they had power to indicate to us God's promises in a very special way. Because they represent, and Jesus says this in Luke, his broken body, that's the bread, and his shed blood on the cross. That's the wine, or the grape juice in our case. That's the sign of the redemption that was promised by God in his covenant to persons of faith. So the Lord's Supper was a time of nourishment for the soul because we're feeding on Christ, who is spiritually present, although not physically present, but spiritually present in a very powerful way during the supper. And so the Lord's Supper is something that's continuing in the life of the church, and it is vital to our health and growth as a church. It's a spiritual meal where individual members are knit together to grow into the one body of Christ. But it was much more than a simple commemorative service because it was an opportunity for a unique meeting to be spiritually present with Christ. And that's an occasion of immense and moving emotion. The Holy Spirit presides at the table for Christ and he is with here with us here 
And that's how Christ manifests now, that he is in heaven with his Father. His spirit is here with us. Now, the famous divine increase matter believed that those who received communion in a loving frame of mind could expect a soul-ravishing awareness of the love of Christ. There's something that's going on in communion, which I hope that we're not missing, because it's a profound thing that we do. But the celebration itself is very simple. The bread and wine were offered in silence after the reading of Christ's words. So our ancestors of faith took it in a contemplative way. The congregation received the bread and the cup seated because kneeling was viewed to be implying that they were worshiping the bread, making an idol of it. So that's why you are served in your seats. Uh, other traditions come up to the rail. There's a communion rail and people come there. Uh, sometimes people are served in the pews but are kneeling in other traditions. But for the early congregationalists, the preoccupation with purity for individual members resulted in what was called a fenced table, where only those known by the church to be right living could take the Lord's Supper. Now Cotton Mather, who was more famous than his father Increase, he advanced the belief that refraining from the Lord's Supper was an offense against our covenant of baptism because the supper itself was a means of assisting us to overcome sin. And so by the 1720s, communion was generally available to all baptized persons. So we don't have a fence table today. Anyone who confesses Lord Jesus as their savior can partake of communion. For many Protestants, the Lord's Supper is simply a ritual of remembrance. Uh, growing up in the Baptist church, this was stressed pretty, pretty strongly, that there's no magic going on at the table. This is strictly a memorial that we do here. But for Congregationalists, the meaning of the Lord's Supper is much more nuanced and complex. In the reading from Luke that I just read to you, the words of Jesus show us that the Lord's Supper is both timely and timeless. And there are three aspects of time that Jesus speaks about here that Luke has recorded, the past, the present, and the future. Now Jesus begins with saying, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. So this reference to the Passover encompassed all of the past history of the nation of Israel for those who heard it. And so by invoking the Passover, Jesus reminded the disciples of God's faithfulness and his promises not just in the Passover event itself, but in all the history of God and, and humanity that preceded it. From Adam to Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph to Moses, all the history that followed right up to that moment when they were sitting at that table on the last night of Jesus' life was in that word, the Passover. Because what Jesus was doing in the Last Supper with his disciples was going to be the ultimate fulfillment of all those covenantal promises that God made, and especially the Passover event, when God himself was going to remove the curse of the angel of death from humanity forever, not just for the Jews, but for all of humanity. So in the Last Supper, Jesus invited the disciples to see yesterday fulfilled. All the sin and suffering of his loved ones would be forgiven and released. Now Jesus took the, the Passover bread and, and the bread was made quickly and it was unleavened. It was something that they could put together in a hurry because they were supposed to be on the move if you remember the Passover story. So this bread was nothing fancy. They didn't go to the, the French bakery and pick out a fancy baguette or anything. They just they put together this little pasty loaf and they put it in the oven really quick and, and that was what they had. So it was a very ordinary bread. But in the ordinary, Jesus encouraged the disciples to see the sacred. Just like when Moses stood in the dirt in front of the burning bush, the Lord said to him, Moses, take off your sandals because here you are on holy ground. He just was standing in, in the dirt in front of a bush, but God made it holy. So breaking the bread into small pieces, Jesus gave it this very mundane substance, bread, and he said, this is my body that's given to you. And these broken pieces symbolized what Jesus would do on the cross. His body would be broken and death would become the spiritual nourishment that would bring life. Taking away the brokenness and death 
of the disciples and all believers after that, and he would heal them so that they would be knit into this one body of Christ that would become the church. So that was the early church sitting there at the table with him, and, and today we sit here together as the church. Do this in remembrance of me. The word Jesus said for remembrance in uh, Greek is, is not a, it's not a static word that just talks about remembering some past event, but it's experiencing the reality of now in, in the way that the remembering is happening. So he's saying right now, as you're remembering me, the reality of my presence is here with you. So remembering is always part of the present, not only the past. And in every day in every household, the bread was gonna be eaten, and every day was a day to remember the Lord. Remember the Passover, remember Golgotha. Remember my promise, Jesus said. Remember, I'm always with you, even to the end of time. So this memorial meal that we've kind of taken out and we've put it in this very special way, in the early church was celebrated a lot more often. Oftentimes at the dinner table, they would celebrate communion. So taking the cup, Jesus said, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's talking about the future, the future breaking into the present. Jesus was with them at the table, but he asked his disciples to see beyond that last supper that he had with them. He said, today, Jesus said, today we are looking forward to the kingdom of God. And once again, Jesus sets the table for the supper for us today. We're gonna to eat this bread and, and drink the fruit of the grapevine. We're gonna receive that nourishment that we need to grow spiritually and to grow together as a strong body of Christ through whom the kingdom of God is coming. And in some ways it's now here. Jesus is here with us. Now, in a present way that is unique because there is a communion of our spirits held together by Christ's Holy Spirit that's alive in the spiritual nourishment we take together, like at no other time. Eternity breaks into time in communion. Heaven becomes real on earth in the dimension of the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper is really a timeless event because it's permeated not with time but with eternity. When we celebrate this supper today, we declare that we welcome the coming of God's kingdom into our lives in a radical way. If your lives are not being changed by Jesus, you're not living in the kingdom. Jesus transforms us through his Holy Spirit to become more and more like him. And so we, today we renew our baptismal vows and we invite Jesus to come into our hearts and our lives and change us so that we will become more and more like him. And so that our present will become our future and so that our future becomes our present. We step out of time when we come to the communion table because we celebrate the time when we're going to be together with all of those who love the Lord at his table in heaven for all eternity where there is no time. So there is no time when we come to the Lord's table because in these moments with Jesus, we become more like him. Who is the beginning and the end? He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The eternal Son of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. You were before the beginning and you have no ending. Time does not contain eternity. And in these moments, you call us to join you, to move outside of time, outside of all that binds us to things, to longings, to plans, to desires, at your table, we meet with you, Lord, as you offer us the simple bread and juice. Ordinary things, but so extraordinary. Elemental signs that direct us to you. To remember the power of your love for us. To thank you for the 
sacrifice of your love for us, to celebrate the presence of your love in us, to see the future of your love with us. Lord, speak to us in this moment, clearly, strongly, and gently, that your word may be heard in our hearts, in our minds, and your will lived out in our lives. Because we are your body, Lord, on earth. This is what others see. When they look at church, they see Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would transform us day by day, that we become more and more like you and that we shine your glory forth into our homes, our communities, and into the world. Lord, this day we have such joy with celebrating communion with Leah for her very first time. And Lord, we ask that you would touch her heart in a very special way, in a way that, that speaks to her and that she knows how blessed she is in your love as your beloved daughter. We ask a blessing on her family, Lord. It's, it's wonderful to have her family here supporting her today and taking communion with you and her together. Yes, we are here to share communion with Leah Murphy and her family. But note the way I use the word share, because that's what we talked about in the class yesterday, right, Leah? This was a meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. He didn't give it to them. Yeah, he told them to keep doing it and keep remembering them, but he shared it with them. So we are here to share that. And as we do that, I think we all reflect that many years have gone by and many of you had children, maybe yourself involved in the class. And maybe in seven or eight years, we might have some twins coming to this class <laughs> from a young lady who was all part of this church in her youth. And there are many other things that come up all year after year. Uh, as I started doing this class, I started putting an M&M tie on. And every once in a while, someone would say, hey, we're going to have M&Ms instead of bread today for the communion? <laughs> the answer is no, sorry, but I have something better for you. I have bed, uh, bread that's been baked for you to share with you by Leah. So Leah, if you could please come up with Mrs. Druin. She has something special for you. <laughs> Great. The book is titled Big in God's Eyes. I please uh, join me in believing and seeing that Leah is now big in God's eyes. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. And a special thanks to Steve and Pam who faithfully have taught the First Communion class for many years and uh, it's a special moment in the life of our children. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. They had a love for God and a love for their families and a love for freedom that brought them to this world. And, 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 and William Bradford exemplifies that. I wish, I wish they had left us some kind of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a training manual, some kind of a, a secret sauce recipe card that we could pick up and go, all right, here's what it is, here's what we do. 
What do we do? How do we get back to that? You now, when um, the children of Israel are going into the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan River and God stood it on in and they walked across. And before the waters stopped parting, God told them to take 12 stones from the bottom of the river and put it up on the top of Mount Gilgal and make a monument. So that when your children ask, what are these stones? They will be able, you will be able to tell them, this is where God parted the sea. And that's what the pilgrims left us. They left us a monument that not only gives tribute to what was accomplished here, but it gives us a specific strategy, a breakout of a blueprint of if we would ever forget what made America great, what made us free, we can go back and follow that strategy and it's right up on a hill a half mile from here. Right here? Right here. It's 180 tons of solid granite. It's the largest granite monument in America, and it's hidden on a hilltop overlooking Plymouth in a residential neighborhood. I've never heard of this. Hardly anybody in America knows about it, and yet the people of America put this together over a 70-year period, paid for by the Congress, paid for by the state legislature in Massachusetts, as a strategy laid out, we call it the Matrix of Liberty, that was given to us by the forefathers, by the pilgrims. And they, those 130 years ago, when they built this, wanted to leave this behind for us. So that if we would ever forget how liberty is built, we would know what to do to regain it. This is how they did it. This is how they did it. Now, if, if somebody else wants to try another way, which is what's happening today in America, we're trying a thousand ways to turn America around, but this is the way it was done. Okay. This is it, the only successful strategy of liberty that has ever been carried out in the history of mankind. Well, let's walk through it. And yeah, this, yeah, we're, let's we're, take this strategy apart. What does this mean? What are they trying to tell us here? Where, so where do you, where do you well, start? Well, her name is Faith. It says so right there. And she is pointing her finger to heaven. Why? For God is. For God is because her faith is in the God of the Bible in Jesus Christ. They knew that the only faith that could bring true liberty was a faith in the one true God and his Bible. And you see a Bible there, an open Bible. It's a Geneva Bible. The pages are opened up, which meant that they read it. And as they read it, and as they had faith in God, he gave them wisdom. That's why you see the star on her forehead. She's given wisdom to know how to live in this world. And all of the rest of these statues, each one weighing almost 20 tons, is tied to faith because without faith, it falls apart. And that's the beginning of it all. When comes to the weary a blessed release, when upward we pass to his kingdom of peace, when free from the woes that on earth we must bear, we'll say good night here, but good morning up there. Good morning up there. Christ is the light. Good morning up there, where cometh no night. When we step from this earth to God's heaven so fair, we'll say good night here, but good morning up there.